if I could have your attention, please. Thank you. We've got an energetic audience tonight. That's uh, that's excellent. Um, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Frances Houle. She's a senior scientist at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where she's the department head for the science of large-scale systems uh, in the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. The uh, uh, we saw today. Um, thanks to Professor Emeritus Joe Ten, that we had a, uh, an early talk on, on artificial photosynthesis in 1981, which uh, Dr. Houle recognized as one of the, the early works in this, in this mm -hmm. field. Mm -hmm. um, she received her bachelor's from UC Irvine and her PhD from Caltech, both in chemistry. Prior to her current appointment, she's been a postdoctoral uh, fellow at LBNL and UC Berkeley. Uh, she's been a research staff member at IBM Almaden, which I believe is where she was when she spoke in the series um, the previous two times. She's a, a three-time uh, visitor to Sonoma State. <laughs> she's uh, been the manager of materials development at Envisage Technologies, a startup firm. She received numerous awards, including the 2009 American uh, Vacuum Society John Thurston Memorial Award and the 1998 IBM Environmental Affairs Excellence Award. She's a fellow of the American Physical Society and a member of the American Chemical Society. She's a vice chair of the APS, American Physical Society Panel on Public Affairs, and a member of a large of the Executive Committee, the APS, um, Division <coughs> of Condensed Matter Physics. Please welcome Dr. Francis Wool. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you for the kind introduction and, and the welcome. It's uh, the first time I talked here was 25 years ago, and I had it. And I, I remember it vividly. It was a wonderful experience. So I've been very, very excited about coming back uh, today. So the talk I'm going to uh, give today is um, it covers a lot of ground, uh, and it has a, an overriding theme of. Uh, sustainable energy and what it really means to be sustainable. So I'm going to I'm going to touch on a lot of different topics that I hope you'll find interesting. Uh, please don't hesitate uh, to interrupt if I'm totally if there's things that that, that people don't understand want more uh, explanation of. I'd rather spend a little bit more time and have everybody get a lot out of the talk than uh, get through all of the slides. Um, so. The, uh, I'll talk a little bit about JCAP in a minute, but I wanted to first start out by talking about why, uh, you know, why artificial photosynthesis, why, and I guess next week you're going to be hearing about biofuels, why these are important new directions for, uh, for um, uh, fuels, and it has to do with the carbon cycle. So there's always a balance between, um, you know, uh, sunlight goes into carbon dioxide uh, plus a leaf, goes to uh, sit in the, in the ground for millennia makes fuel that we then extract and we convert into something we put into for transportation, which puts more CO2 back. And this is a closed cycle, but the closed cycle is very long and it's millions of years. And that's one of the reasons why the carbon dioxide is building up in the air. It's out of whack right now. Biofuels has a, has a, a, a shorter cycle um, where you would take, uh, grow crops over a period of a year and convert it directly to, to fuels and therefore you'd get the, the energy back out and this carbon dioxide it would hopefully be a little bit more in balance with, uh, with the uh, growth of the, of the plant materials that go into making fuels. Um, artificial photosynthesis is sort of like a next generation. Uh, it's very early stage. There's no such thing as a technology or a, an industry that does artificial photosynthesis at this time. It's something we're trying to lay the foundation for. So we're, in your lifetimes, this will probably happen. In my lifetime, it probably won't. It's that early stage. Um, so in this case, we would take carbon dioxide and sunlight and using a, a semiconductor device, which I'll talk a little bit about, then we would uh, directly make fuels that would, uh, would produce uh, carbon dioxide. And this, all of these are closed cycle, but this, these two, this one is like on an annual cycle. This one, if we did it right, could be on a daily cycle, for example. Of, of taking carbon dioxide out, making it into fuels, and turning it back into, in, into carbon dioxide without ever added any, adding anything more, but meeting all of our needs for transportation. So why chemical fuels? I mean, we hear a lot about electric cars and, and things like that, and that's, it is an important part. And for that, I'd like you to just consider uh, my friend the donut, 
<laughs> um, so the donut has uh, about 400 calories, and we know that that's 400 kilocalories in, in uh, energy units, and that's about 1.7 megajoules. And, to, and that corresponds to about 460 watt hours of energy. The best laptop batteries are about 45 watt hours. So it takes 10 laptop batteries to make one donut's worth of energy. So the, the idea here is that chemical energy is very dense. And so it, and it's, and you can take, you can carry it anywhere. You don't need to hook it up to anything to recharge it. You, you, once it's, it's there, it is what they call dispatchable. You can take it anywhere that it needs to be uh, used. So this, it's, it's a much more attractive way of storing energy than a battery is. And in fact, in, in grid energy storage, in some of the renewable energy storage, uh, converting uh, not into donuts into hydrogen is one of the, the options that people are actually looking at. So what's, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, JCAP. Uh, JCAP is a, what is called an energy innovation hub. Um, the first of these were, were started uh, by President Obama, um, or proposed by President Obama and funded by Congress. We're a line item in the congressional budget. So that means we're, we're we get a lot of scrutiny for our success, which is both good and bad. Um, and uh, there were there were five altogether that were founded. Four of them still exist, and all of them were founded to put a lot of money into a critical problem, critical problem with critical mass number of people and skills and um, and in, in the best institutions involved. And so we are focused on artificial photosynthesis. Um, this is a partnership mostly between Caltech and, and Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, a small part played by uh, the SLAC uh, National Laboratory in uh, Palo Alto, and then uh, UC Irvine and UC San Diego have a small participation as well. We are standalone centers, so we have two. We are housed in two buildings. One is the Jorgensen Laboratory, and this is the Solar Energy Research Center that we just started moving into last week. We've been in leased space all this time, and um, and we're we're just starting to to occupy this this building. It'll be out above the ALS. The ALS is just on the other, if you could see the dome, it would be just on the other side. It's sort of the very top of the, of the site for people who know it. We have about 180 scientists and engineers, uh, and they include disciplines all the way from quantum chemistry, the theoretical chemistry, all the way through to civil engineering. So we're highly multidisciplinary, and we all work together in teams to solve various problems all, uh, along our roadmap. And we have um, advanced uh, capabilities in computation. So we're, we're pretty much standalone. So we have everything in our laboratories that we need to use all the time. We don't have to spend a lot of time chasing around to measure this or build that, which makes us able to move very quickly. It's a very fast-paced program. So JCAP's mission, I want to read this because these are important points. So its mission is to actually demonstrate a scalably manufacturable, so this is something that has a pathway to, to being a technology, solar fuels generator um, using earth abundant elements, so being the idea here is sustainable, uh, that with no wires, meaning it's completely monolithic and passive, it doesn't need to be hooked up to anything to provide electricity, it just works all by itself. Robustly, which means it works well, it doesn't, it, it, it will work for long periods of time without having to fuss with it, produces fuel from the sun 10 times more efficiently than current crops. That's the mission of this, this uh, funding uh, period started in 2010 and ends in September. In September, uh, we, we've applied for renewal. Uh, we haven't gotten official word yet, but I'm optimistic that we will be renewed for another five years. And the idea, and this is, was uh, Melvin Calvin's idea, uh, w was that um, if we understand what's going on well enough in, in natural photosynthesis, we should be able to build a device that would mimic it and make uh, and, art, and, and actually do it fully artificially using man-made materials. So I'm going to talk about what we're doing to get there. Um, the first item of business is how, what, how does a, a natural photosynthesis actually work? And believe me, I'm not an expert at this, so I apologize to all the biologists in the room. Uh, but the, the idea here is that um, there's a... a, a, a a single product is formed as a result of uh, natural photosynthesis through a very complex chain of events. It takes, uh, a, it takes about uh, eight photons altogether to make one sugar. And there's, the first excitation is through a body called photosystem two that splits water to make oxygen uh, and then takes the protons and 
then they go through some dark reactions and then take more excitation, more photons and more electrons and you wind up with two precursors to sugar. And so the net is that one precursor to sugar takes four photons that you make two, two per cycle because of the water splitting. And this is called the Z scheme. And the Z scheme, it just means that there's two, uh, that you, you have to do two steps in energy in order to make this happen. Um, in artificial photosynthesis, we also have a Z scheme. This Z, this Z is produced by two back-to-back -back semiconductors. And I'll be talking about how this works in a minute. But I just want you to, to get, get that this is basically the same thing uh, in, in terms of energy. Also, um, in terms of, of numbers of photons to make a product, it's kind of the same efficiency as well. One photon will give you one hydrogen atom in, in this scheme if you're just splitting water and making hydrogen as a fuel. If you're making a carbon-based fuel from carbon dioxide, it would take between 6 and 12 photons or even more to make, uh, to make one molecule. <clears throat> so very uh, complex, inefficient chemistry. So let me talk a little bit about the semiconductors. And, and um, I'll just walk through this a little bit so that you appreciate uh, the, the complexity of, of this enterprise that is going on worldwide. There's a large number of people that are working on this worldwide. We're just one center among many. But we're the only ones that are really focused on making devices. Most of the other people are really focused on, on getting the materials right. So it's, a, it's a, good, um, a good spectrum of activities. So here's our Z scheme again. And, what, and the way that it works is we have two, uh, two semiconductors, one doped N-type, electron-rich, and the other doped P-type, which is hole-rich, positive charge-rich. Um, they have different band gaps. One is a band gap uh, of about 1.7 eV. The other is about 1 eV. Light will come in from this side. It will be partially absorbed by the first layer, and then the rest of it absorbed by the second layer. In both layers, you produce electronic excitation that produces one electron and one hole, a hole just being a, a, an electron vacancy or a positive charge. <coughs> because you have these things joined together, the holes and the electrons all go in different directions, and the doping makes that happen too. So the holes will go out toward the surface, in this case positive charge goes to the surface, and the electrons will all go toward the back, out to this side. So now what you should imagine is a piece of solid, you know, just, you know imagine just a, something about credit card thickness, um, that has, you, where you shine light on one side, and you have uh, the, all the holes, all the positive charge going toward that side, that they're at exactly the right energy to be able to split water into hydrogen. Then, at the same time, the electrons are going to the back, and all the hydrogen, all the protons that are formed on this side, migrate around to the back. This is just a, a, a piece of, of material. I forgot to say it's floating in electrolytes, floating in a, a liquid with, with salts. Um, and the protons will go around and, and recombine at the back to make hydrogen. So if you do your job right, you have oxygen bubbling off of one side, and hydrogen bubbling off of the other. And if you had carbon dioxide, as a, as a precursor, you put the carbon dioxide over here, the protons would come around and react with the carbon dioxide to turn it into hydrocarbon fuels. That's the, that's the basic idea here. And what makes this special, there's a number of things, it, is that these energy levels all have to line up right, and these, they also have to line up right relative to the uh, potential required to split water and also to, um, to uh, convert protons into hydrogen. So you can't just use a photovoltaic that you would use for making uh, on the sun, uh, be in a solar panel on your roof. It can't be the same material. It has to have exactly the right energetics, which, it, and which is what makes it a challenge. So as I said, this has been a, a something people have been thinking about for a long time, and there are a number of different ways that people have, have thought about doing it. One would be to just simply take a photovoltaic, which makes electricity, and then hook it up to an electrolyzer, which will simply split, split water as two separate units. Um, the advantage of this is, is that people are already doing this. It's very efficient. Um, there's, a, there's a company called Proton on site that does this commercially and is using it to make hydrogen to charge fuel cells. And they have a demonstration project in uh, the Bay Area for fuel cell powered buses that uses their product. So th this is known, but the thing is, is that the cost of electricity and the components really make this not scalable, um, and although this company is working pretty hard at it. Another way of doing it is to have a powder suspended in a liquid, uh, in a, a, a so-called slurry, 
uh, that where the, you'd have the right semiconductor there and it would just simply split water and then hydrogen and oxygen would bubble out together. Uh, the advantages of this is it's ultra simple and the powders are cheap. Uh, the challenge is that it's actually quite low efficiency uh, for reasons I'm not going to talk about today, but it has to do with, with too much back reaction. And also, you co-generate oxygen and hydrogen, and I think all of you might remember what happens when you do that. It's, it's a serious explosion hazard. Um, finally, there's a fully integrated photoelectrochemical device, which is the third option, and that's what, I'm, that's what JCAP is working on. That's what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to walk through this cartoon so that you understand what you're looking at in the slide. So remember I talked about these two semiconductors back to back, one n-type and one p-type, sunlight coming in from one side. So this is the n-type silicon right here. Uh, sunlight would come in through this side and uh, water would split here, oxygen would come out. So that's this side here. This side is the p-type side and this is the side that will generate the fuel. This has a little liquid dripping out, it's a pretty cartoon, but it, it would come out on this side. Now, the reason for showing it with wires, and we have worked with wires, but I'm not going to talk about those results today, um, is that uh, the materials that are being used are ones that uh, actually don't conduct electricity all that efficiently. And so you want to have the, the electrons and the holes be born really close to the surface and have to only move a little, little ways away in order to, to have efficiency. And, and so a wire is a good vehicle for that because then it would just go out the sides. Um, you, you have to use a catalyst because by themselves these semiconductors aren't active enough. Uh, so you put you put extra metal or and other materials, metal oxides, on the surfaces that boost the reaction. Um, now, in in this scheme here, the the electrons would go this way, but you're making hydrogen ions when you split water. You make little protons up here. They actually go down through a separate transport pathway through the electrolyte that this is sitting in and through a membrane that is located in the middle. And the membrane serves two purposes. One is it serves to separate the hydrogen and oxygen side, and it permits uh, the gases, um, the, it, it keeps the gases from going from one side to the other uh, and mixing and improves efficiency. Uh, it also provides a way for the protons alone to leak from one side to another. So we make these membranes too. Um, finally, uh, all of this is sitting in uh, in, in an electrolyte, and it turns out to get high efficiency, you have to work at pH 1, uh, sorry, less than 1 or greater than 13. So you have to work at pH 0 or pH 14. And as you can imagine, this puts huge strain on the materials. Um, you also need to uh, have a photocurrent that's better than 10 milliamps per square centimeter, and you have to have a photovoltage that's in excess of 1.6 volts, and, and 2 volts is better. That's pretty hard to get with, uh, with these semiconductors, actually. There's only a few sets of materials that will do it. So um, before I dive into what we're doing, I just want to talk a little bit more about how we go about this. Because uh, traditionally, when you do uh, you know, science of this type, you'd start down here, you discover materials, and then you find some materials that will work together. And then you would make assemblies, and you try them in devices. It's a, it's a great way to go. It gets the science right, but it's very inefficient because you can spend a lot of time down here on things that would never make it into here because they, they won't work together well. We actually go the other way around. We start with what the device has to do and then use that to inform what the materials assemblies have to perform at and then use that to, to, uh, to decide on the materials that we're going to use. So to do all of this, so we, we, we operate this way. Um, and to do all of this, we have uh, we do our own design and fabrication and testing prototypes. Uh, we do a lot of simulation and modeling. We do a lot of multi-physics modeling as well as a lot of theory. Um, we have a high throughput materials discovery uh, activity, which I'll talk to you about at the end. And we're, as I mentioned, we're uh, highly multidisciplinary, and we do a lot of performance benchmarking. So we're really trying to work quantitatively, demonstrate quantitatively that we're making progress. And finally, we make really good use of the Department of Energy user facilities. And for those of you who don't know about this, these are free facilities uh, that are operated by the Department of Energy uh, that have advanced X-ray sources, uh, um, capacity to make uh, nanoscale materials. Uh, this is high, uh, high performance computation. This is electron microscopy. All of these are located in the Bay Area. And uh, we, we utilize these advanced um, capabilities to do measurements that are not possible to do in a laboratory. 
So these are, it's, it's something I like to advertise because it's something that's open to anybody here. Uh, if they have a proposal that's accepted, you can go work and do experiments there. Okay, so, um, you know, how do you build a prototype of something like this and we have no idea what it ought to look like? Well, people have done that before, and, and I love this photo. Um, this, of course, looks precisely like what they were trying to do, which was to make a bird um, that would fly and that people could sit in. Um, but because birds don't scale, especially not made of wood, this, of course, crashed and, and wasn't any good. So the, 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 uh, the actual flyer that they first worked, the Wright brothers first worked with, it didn't really look like this very much. So if, a lot of the initial work going on in solar fuels takes things look, look kind of like a leaf. You know, there'll be like this little flat panel and it'll have, you know, st stuff happening on both sides. Hopefully, they like to, people like to work at near neutral pH, which is terrible for efficiency. Um, we're trying to get at this, at least as, as a starting point. And so we do a lot of work to say, you know, what, what will it take to make a, a, a working device? So the, the um, we're, we really run this as, as a, in a very uh, disciplined way, really doing the physics right at every point. Um, we have, you can start with a conceptual design and then decide on the operating parameters. You know, how, what voltage do you want? What, what, um, how big do you want it to be? What materials are you making it of? And so on. Uh, then we design the chassis. Uh, and we actually do a lot of multi-physics modeling of, what, of the chassis. I'll talk about that in a little bit of, of you know, what, what works and what doesn't work. Uh, then we build it. We have a 3D printer. We can do mock-ups very quickly. And then um, from ones that we like and that work well, we, can, uh, we actually have them made in a shop. And then we do a lot of testing and performance where we measure not only the electrical properties, but also the products coming out to make sure that we have a quantitative measure of, of our efficiency. We do manufacturability and scale-up analyses as well um, at, at a fairly low level, and, and I'll be talking about that in a bit. So not to scare you, but the, the, there's a lot that goes into the modeling, actually. And so the stuff in the, in the turquoise and the teal here is all you need to really read. Um, we have to worry about the, the, uh, the uh, optical properties of the light absorbers. We have to worry about the semiconductor device properties. Uh, we have to worry about how the kinetics of interfacial charge transfer, so how charge moves around inside of this body. We have to worry about transport of ions and acid base equilibria. And we have to worry about macroscopic transport uh, of, of things from one end to another in a device that will be this big. So we've developed uh, console models that allow us to do all of this. And they, we actually have, if you go to our website, there is a, a modeling a capability where you can feed in parameters and see how well it would work. And so you can play with things yourself to just get a feel for, for all of these, um, these uh, parameters. So let me give you one example of how we've applied it. Uh, we were trying to, this isn't the wire device, these are flat films. Um, and flat films are a lot easier to make than the wire devices. Uh, and everything we'll be talking about is the, is the wire uh, device architecture. Um, so what we were, asked ourselves is, how can we make something that would have maximum efficiency? And we have to consider several things. One is the amount of light absorbing area. So we want the, um, the, to have uh, minimum support structure maximum uh, exposure of the, of the light absorbing elements here and then, so that led to the tilt. Um, we also uh, have to have a membrane which will, separates the gases and allows uh, the, the uh, ions to go back and forth between the, the, uh, the two sides, the photoanode side and the photocathode side. And these show the field lines and you can see that, they, that the fields really are concentrated right in going through the membrane. So there's only so much charge density you can put in one spot. And so that, the size of that membrane and shape determines the efficiency of the device and also how close they are together uh, to one another. So we can calculate these things. And with that, we can get full just geometries out. This has to be this long, this big, this thick, and so on. And we can also uh, do things like optimize the exact tilt angle to get the right, uh, the, uh, the right absorption. So, so we have, you know, how to make it. But I also mentioned that these things are either in, uh, in uh, Drano or in battery acid, okay? And that's what it does to materials. It, you know, it does, it, these pHs do bad things. So the corrosion is, is a real issue. So another thing that JCAP has worked on is how to make things corrosion proof. 
and there's really two ways of, of uh, doing it. Um, there, and it's not that we, we, we followed up on some leads in the literature, but we've made this, I would say, we've sort of brought it to a much deeper level than other groups have done who have just shown, um, in, have, have shown leading but not comprehensive studies. Um, so backing up, there's two ways that you can make things corrosion proof. One is to choose a semiconductor material where the energy levels are such that the charge carriers won't react, make it react with itself. It won't oxidize itself, it'll oxidize water. So that's about having the redox levels in the right place and you can calculate where those are. Um, so this would be something that would be intrinsically stable and I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, the, failing that, you just coat it up with something that is. And, and things, you, you're not asking this to be a good semiconductor, you know, the top layer to be a good semiconductor, you're just asking it to be corrosion proof, and that's what happens here. So the electrons and uh, holes are, are produced down in the bottom, um, and then they can leak through this, this corrosion protection layer, and the reaction occurs at the top. They're in fully separating away the, uh, the reactive uh, zone from the, uh, from the uh, uh, zone where the, the uh, electronic excitation occurs, and therefore you get no corrosion of this of this semiconductor, and it works really well. We've done a lot of it. You know, we've done it for um, uh, protecting indium phosphide. We've done it for protecting uh, silicon in various forms. Um, we've made a lot of use of titanium dioxide produced deposited in different ways, so that you can get charge across it and so on. So just as, just to sh you know show you that this is a whole talk by itself, uh, but it's something that actually allows you to, um, to work with very corrosive materials and not worry about losing the semiconductor. Yeah, Dr. Hu, can you talk about the, that band gap? But really, you're talking about the, the, the energy of the photon of light coming in. Uh -huh. 1.7 um, electron volts is very blue, right? I mean, so you're talking about making, you want materials that are hardened against blew up through maybe some UV photons to not corrode. Is That's that correct. correct? That's correct, yes. Um, and, and for we, so the, the stack of semiconductors has 1.7 volts on the top one, and then one volt uh, silicon, for example, on the bottom one. And so light goes all the way through and is absorbed by both semiconductors. The one that you want to be, um, only one of these is facing the light. So photo corrosion will only happen on one side. Um, that's the side that is facing the light. Spontaneous corrosion would happen on both, um, potentially on both sides. So you have to protect against all of those, those reaction mechanisms. And basically, coating it with titanium dioxide or, in, in some, or nickel, another one that works is cobalt oxide, all work pretty well for different circumstances. And, and, and coating them with titanium oxide is like literally <laughs> like... Um, sunblock, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is the much. canonical yeah. sunblock. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's a great way of putting it, exactly. It's basically a sunblock. Okay, so we actually built one of these things, and, um, and what you can see here are the, um, uh, are the semiconductor stacks. This thing is, happens to be a triple junction device for those of you who are interested in semiconductors. Um, the, uh, this, the, this stack of materials is, is, is all layered together. Uh, it's put on these two slots. Uh, there's a membrane that'll sit in between, and this is what we call a louver device. This uh, out, outer frame here was one that would have been 3D printed from the color. It's a little bit yellowish. Uh, and so we can, we can make this thing, and we can actually test it and make sure it works. And this is a first generation device. Um, the, this, this top material here is tungsten oxide. It actually has a band gap of about 2.7 volts which is way too blue. So it actually doesn't absorb light, uh, the, sun, the sun spectrum that well. And because of that, it, um, uh, it's very, this thing is, is quite inefficient. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a proof of principle that we could make a full working um, assembly this way. And that was the first time anybody had ever done that. Uh, and we could test it. We can see how much hydrogen is coming out. Uh, and it has a convert solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency of about half a percent, which is equal to a leaf, not 10 times better. But, it, but we did this with full separation of, of hydrogen from oxygen uh, and, and demonstrated that this uh, whole approach works. And this thing lasted for 50 hours uh, in a pH of zero, so it's in, in acid. Um, we are now uh, working on a much better device, and I'm not sure how you do this. Well, it's, sorry, just testing my ability to, I've never tried to do this before. Let me see if I can get this started. Um, Yeah, 
I wanted to show you a video uh, of this, so let me just... So here, I'm, all right. oops, I think it's not, it's not sizing um, correctly. So, I, if, so if you know how to start, a, I feel pretty feeble at the moment, but if you know how to start a video out of, um, out of this, that would be if, great. If it's, um you can usually get to the play controls if you kind of wiggle the trackpad around when you're in the slide. So okay, let me try that. Then. Slide view. Okay. And then see if. Oh, it did it. There Thank you. you. There we go. Thank you. Sorry, I'm I'm uh, not as sophisticated as I should be. All right. So this is a device. The same thing that I just showed you, except instead of having two slides, it just has one, but it has membrane uh, in uh, embedded. And let me just start it. Um, and it's made with gallium arsenide, uh, and therefore has a uh, a very high efficiency. And so now you can see uh, that's hydrogen coming off the front. This thing, this thing has a this the hydrogen recombination side facing the sunlight in this particular one, and 11.73 percent. We've gotten as high as 14 percent solar to hydrogen, uh, but they only last for maybe a day because of the corrosion problem. Little, the tiniest little pinholes are enough for this, this material. And Dr. Who, was that number we should have in our head is a half a percent would be like a leaf? Yes, the yes. ability to make yeah. chemicals with the bond energy. That's right. I should think of that as sort of the bond, the, the residual bond yeah. energy, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. So let me just, um, let me, I'm going to talk now a bit about Okay, so we've shown, we have a prototype, basically. We've shown that we, we, can, we, we can make something that at least halfway works in the lab. This isn't, this is very far from being commercially interesting, but we can at this point decide whether we're on the right track at all. And one of the, the, the um, analysis methods that we are using to understand this is something called prospective life cycle assessment. And what this allows, it's, it, life cycle assessment, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a discipline, it's about 35 years old, I think. Um, it is fully, it's very formal, has an ISO formal process that you use for doing these analyses, widely used and taught throughout the world uh, because it allows you to decide in a quantitative way whether one thing is better than another from an energy use or a cost or environmental impact point of view. Um, so, and if you have an existing product, you can, you can do this process pretty well. But we don't have an existing product. We don't have a plant. We don't have anything. So we're, we're going to just go ahead, based on what we know, we're going to just uh, imagine what a full facility might look like. And then we'll do a full analysis, and we'll look at things like product and environmental foot, uh, footprints and health and, and, impact, and environmental impacts, and then feed that back to say, are we on the right track or not? So... This is like going to this, okay? So you can imagine the Wright brothers could never have imagined what a major airport would have looked like. Um, saying, you just saw this, um, we can't, we're, we're just going to pretend we, we know what this would look like, but we know a lot about solar facilities, and so we're just going to take a stab at it and, and see where we, where we wind up for a one gigawatt scale plant. Now, there are many things that we can do with this type of analysis. We're not going to look at cost but we are going to look at, at impacts. And particularly, we're going to ask the question, if we build one of these things, would we get as, enough, as much energy out as we put in to make it and operate it and tear it back down? Because if the answer was really no, 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 no way, then we'd have to ask pretty hard questions about whether this was worth, worth doing at all. There are other things that you can look at, water use, land use, uh, you know, various uh, emissions, uh, economic impacts for uh, replacement of one technology by another, and we've done the water use and land use, but I won't talk about that um, today. So we did, we've published two studies. Um, one of them took this device, uh, took a little bit different configuration than the one that I showed you before using just micro wires. And um, we asked the question is, if you built this device all by itself, would you get enough energy, the same, would you get more energy out than you put in to make it? And uh, the answer to that is uh, shown here. 
this, this along this axis is lifetime of the device. So it's, it, this is in years, from five years out to 30. And this is the solar to hydrogen efficiency going from 3% up to 10%. And you can see that as long as it's 5% efficient and lasts for five years, you're net energy positive. This was great news. But a lot of people inside JCAP were pretty worried when this analysis was done because they were afraid it would show the wrong answer. But in fact, it showed, it showed that there's really some potential here for doing something that, that could really work. So then let's put this device into a full-scale plant. So this is where the civil engineering came in. A plant was designed, uh, had panels. So these, these things were put on into big panels. They were sized so they could fit into trucks, be driven out, assembled into big fields. Uh, the field, fields be put in big facilities. And it, I know you can't read it here, but these are many, kilom many square kilometers for a gigawatt scale for hydrogen at, 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 at roughly 10% efficiency. Uh, that's a lot of land mass. And the reason for that is because the sun is so diffuse. So this is something you know, that is not good about this is the land use. But the, um, uh, that, that was one thing that came out of it, but we we're gonna only look at the energy impacts for now. Uh, and so what we did was to just break down the problem. We looked at things like how much energy does it uh, take to actually make the cell? How much energy does it take to make the, the frames and the chassis that you put the cell in? How much energy does it take to build the roads out to the facility? How much energy does it take to decommission the facility after you've operated it for a while? So the, all of these things were looked at. And these, this here is primary, primary energy use per facility for each of these categories. And you can see that the big ones are the cell fabrication and the cell materials that go in, and, and other are just the frames, you know, the, the boxes and the frames and things like that, um, and the panel structure. Uh, but nonetheless, we found that if you had a device that was 10% efficient and lasted for 10 years, you would be uh, fully energy uh, uh, paid back in about eight years of operation and overall, the lifetime of the plant, which was 30 years, you would get an energy return on energy invested of about 70%. This was really good news also, because this says, as crude as our understanding is today about architectures doing it in the, in the most brute force way possible, we're still in net energy positive territory. So this is very encouraging. And we know that, in, and moreover, by doing this, we also know what things we can work on to make things better. So it turns, what we did was to do a sensitivity analysis to say, okay, um, what, what things are our biggest lever arm, arms here? And the biggest ones are the solar to hydrogen efficiency and the lifespan of the cell. So that means from a research perspective, if we make things um, more efficient and more durable, then the energy return on energy invested will only go up. And, and this will become much more sustainable in the long term. So from a research perspective, this shows us where we should be working. And in fact, this is where we are working. This is where a, a lot of people in the field are working. But I think this, the, this crystallizes uh, that this is a better focus than just about anything else, including things like the, the, the earth abundant materials thing. So let me talk a little bit about earth abundant materials. Um, this is a really interesting paper uh, that, uh, that came out. <coughs> And what this is a plot of is the, um, the log of the crustal abundance of all of the elements in the periodic table versus the log of annual production. Log log plot, plots are, 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 this thing is, is a scatter plot even on a log log scale. Um, so there's a lot of variability from element to element. But what I, this line, this dash line across the top here is that this trend line says that if you're on the trend line, you're producing the element in, you're extracting the element at roughly in proportion to its crustal abundance. If you're below this trend line, you're pulling it out faster. And if you're above the trend line, you're underproducing it, you're not producing it as fast in, or in proportion to its amount, uh, the amount that, there's, that is, is there. And everything in red are all elements that are commonly used in various solar fuels architectures across the whole uh, community. So things like tin and antimony, uh, chromium, copper, uh, so on, all fall below this line, which means that they are being extracted far more quickly than they are being uh, than in proportion to their abundance, which means they have a risk of actually becoming uh, a critical or, or supply constraint. So what controls sustainability and, and sustainable use of, of, of materials? Um, 
I love this this tree because I'm not a geologist, so I didn't really appreciate until I started learning about all of this that um, when you extract a uh, one of any of these primary materials that are in the big boxes here, you also get a whole bunch of other stuff with it. And so, for example, to get tellurium, we use in cadmium tellurium solar cells by for solar, for example. Um, you would have to, you extract it by electrolyzing and purifying copper. So you have to pull a whole lot of copper out of the ground to get a little bit of tellurium. Um, same goes for uh, zinc, for example. Uh, zinc is the main, the, the primary element here, but it also uh, tends to have a lot of antimony in it. If you wanted antimony, which is used in, in compound semiconductors, you'd have to pull out a lot of zinc, and by the way, you also get thorium at the same time. Oh, and that's on the titanium side. Sorry, the, that's where the thorium is. The zinc is not so, not so much radioactive, but a lot of these do come accompanied by radioactive elements. And that means that that makes the, the mining that much more difficult and expensive. Um, so things that affect uh, whether an element is available or not is only partly crustal abundance or roof abundance. It also has to do with what you have to dig out to get with it and also um, uh, it, it, whether there's uh, hazardous materials involved, whether the separation chemistry even exists to separate one from the other, and so on. So it's, a, it's really a fascinating area. Well, I should also ask, uh, mention that to open a mine takes between five and 15 years. So it's not something that can respond quickly. Um, and that, uh, this is an example of, of some of the things that can happen. Uh, these are two studies that were, came out a few years ago that I was involved in. Uh, on critical materials, uh, and it's really quite a fascinating area. Uh, one of the examples taken from this this one was the um, looking at the price of indium versus time. Now, indium is used in touch screens, so it's indium ten, ten oxide is, is used in there. And so you'll see that um, up until, you know, the, 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 the price was kind of falling, and then when laptops were introduced, there was a giant jump in price. And the reason for that is that the supply of indium just couldn't catch up. Everybody wanted to use it for laptops. And so it, 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 people were scrambling, getting more supplies, more sources, uh, and eventually it all settled down and, and came back to a, a stable price again. But meanwhile, any business that was trying to operate in here had to contend with wildly fluctuating prices, which could put them in danger of going out of business. Similarly, when the TVs uh, came, uh, it came in, the flat screen TVs, there was another huge jump in in cost. So th this volatility, when you talk about things being overproduced, this is the kind of volatility that can ensue and it can make it very difficult to make, uh, to launch a brand new technology. Finally, I wanted to just make some comments about recyclability. So if you can't dig it out of the ground, then maybe you can reuse it with stuff that already exists that has been dug out of the ground. This is another paper that recently came out, periodic table, and each element is represented by a pie chart. Um, the, the blue uh, ones are, are elements, uh, the blue area means it's potentially recyclable. The yellow means there's no known way to recycle it. And the red means it's it use, in use it's dissipated, which means it's spread out so much all over the place, like, um, like for example, platinum out of, um, and palladium out of, of, of cars, um, uh, smog, uh, the catalytic converters, thank you. <laughs> I knew it would come. Um, you know, they just get spread out all over the roads. And, and then it's not recoverable. Um, so you'll notice there's a lot of variability in recyclability of things. Now, I, mentioned, I, I did mention about titanium being uh, an important material for ensuring stability of these uh, devices. And titanium is, in fact, in, uh, is largely unrecyclable in the way that we use it. Yes, it's hugely abundant on Earth, but you know, you, the economics of continuing to extract it will become problematic over time. And the reason it's unrecyclable is because we use it in pigments, it's in paint. So it's sitting on everybody's walls, and it's not something that's going to be easy to pull out uh, if we should need it. And the economics of making paint are going to drive the economics of getting a titanium dioxide for solar fuels devices. So it's, it's quite an interesting uh, area in, in, in all of us in doing fundamental research, yes, it's interesting to discover the physics, but if you want your discoveries to be used, it's important to think about using materials that actually have a chance of, 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 of uh, having an, a, a, enough supply that they will uh, be available when you want them. So what happens if they don't, if they're not available? Um, and, you, and you need to switch materials, or you need to find materials that have better performance. 
And this has been a big activity at JCAP, not in Berkeley, but down at, at Caltech. And it's quite amazing what they've done. So the idea of doing combinatorial, com uh, you know, combining different materials randomly together to see what you get is very old. It's been around for hundreds of years. Um, and uh, if you're just, all you're doing is just combining things and then testing each one to see if it has function, uh, it can take a long time and, and generally hasn't been useful. So it's, it's got a pretty bad reputation uh, in the scientific community, to be honest. But the, the uh, staff member down at Caltech, um, a guy named John Gregoire, has really taken this to a completely new level. And what he's doing is not only is he doing combinatorial printing of combinations of materials, and these are oxides, but he's also built a whole suite of different um, analytical tools that allow you to, on the fly, uh, determine in, in just a, a few seconds whether the material is any good or not. So you can, it, you can generate things uh, like these quaternary plots, which tell you which regions have got the right level of activity. And this can be done, these plates and this kind of analysis are done in well under a day. And so we've been focusing on the quaternary compounds, so quaternary oxides, quaternary nit nitrites, because this is a material space that nobody in their right mind would try to do in the lab. I mean, you have to do just too many combinations, and it would just be, it would just be random whether you want, wound, up, wound up with anything useful. But he can do it, you know, that team can do it systematically. So things that turn out to be interesting, then we can resynthesize them and take them through uh, other <coughs> analytical tools. Some of them are combinatorial, where you just step around on a plate. Others, where you, you know, have to work with single samples. So one example of something that we've done in JCAP was to, uh, to, to look at, at catalysts for doing water oxidation. As I mentioned, that's the source of protons that's going to ultimately become fuel. So it's a critical reaction. And it's, um, it's uh, the energy cost of doing it is actually one of the things that directly affects efficiency of these devices. So most of the, of the, uh, the known catalysts are of the nickel iron oxide variety. And you can see a little you know, warm spot right there from catalytic activity. Um, people put in cobalt sometimes get a little bit of extra activity. Uh, some, a little bit of work was done um, in the lab, uh, not by JCAP, but by other people saying, okay, if I throw in cerium, it makes it even a little bit better. So they thought, what the heck, let's just look at the whole cerium space. So they did, they made um, materials using inject printing of cerium, iron, nickel, cobalt, oxide and found that, in fact, at the 50% cerium mark, there was this whole new part, uh, region of activity that nobody even knew about. And uh, it's, it's located up here. Uh, so these, these catalysts uh, have activity down at very low operating potentials where nobody else uh, has been able to, to work. So the, from an electrochemistry point of view, this is completely novel and, and unexpected, uh, that why cerium, which is, which is electrochemically dead, could make a catalyst better. Um, we've done a lot of science associated with this, and one of the things that we've learned is that the, the material is actually little tiny nano, nano phase separated dispersion of cerium with nickel iron oxide nanocrystals of around two nanometers. And we don't know why this phase separated dispersion works so well, but it does. And this is, is uh, something that We've got some ideas, but this is outside of anything that anybody's ever looked at scientifically from a, a mechanistic point of view. Um, we, we know a lot about its structure, and we've also gone ahead and looked at all the other lanthanides and found that a lot of them have got really valuable um, properties too, in addition to optical transparency that's, uh, that's very helpful. So, mentioned that we had this idea. He, you know, they went ahead and synthesized the inks. They made the, the plates, tested them. Uh, found this nice region of activity, resynthesized it, uh, put it inside of a, a prototype and, uh, and tested that, found that it had the right uh, activity and the, and the right properties. Uh, all of that was done within a period of about two months. So this is going from notion to fully fledged discovery of a new catalyst in only two months. And that's something that's impossible to do as quickly if you're just working material by material in the lab. In turn, and and, and is, is shows the power of, of this whole approach. Um, in terms of discovering semiconductors, uh, I mentioned that earlier um, that there's two ways of stabilizing a semiconductor. One is to find one that's intrinsically stable, and the other is to find is to coat it with something that is sunscreen, basically. Um, <clears throat> uh, in this case, the question was asked. 
can we find a semiconductor that is both stable, uh, intrinsically stable to electrochemical, you know, in, in, in the presence of acid or base in, in, under electrochemical conditions, and also has the right band gap, this 1.7 eV band gap that's optimum. And uh, so we, we knew that uh, bismuth vanadate was pretty good. It's around 2.2 volts. And people, and people have been working with bismuth vanadate a lot, so we understand its properties pretty well. So, so they started throwing other metals into it just to see if they could get the, the band gap to be a bit narrower. And what they found is that they found a region of good band gap right in the, the manganese vanadate uh, uh, line, which, which means that the, this, this material was, was something that was really unknown uh, to have all, all these optimum properties. And uh, it, the, the screening tool that, that was used for this is very clever. You have an optical fiber come in and two integrating spheres, so you can measure transmission and reflection at the same time just by scanning over the plate. This whole thing is calibrated using a, a color uh, calibration chart, and uh, they can on the fly calculate the band gap from a, a, from the top the top plot from the optical properties uh, and, and have the whole thing mapped out in, in just a few hours. It's really very clever. This this uh, this paper just came out uh, a little bit ago. Um, so it turned out that in another part of JCAP, some people were also working on the theory. And this is a, these people are not doing high throughput um, <clears throat> uh, synthesis, they're doing high throughput theory. So it's a technique where you calculate very precisely certain uh, areas of, of composition space and things like electronic structure and so on. And then you interpolate in between them to uh, predict what, other, what the properties of other, uh, other uh, compositions might look like. Um, the, there's a whole website on this. It's called the Materials Project, and you can uh, you can they have apps, and you can do all kinds of fun things uh, trying to predict properties of, of random compositions of materials. Uh, so the, it's a it's a project that's led by MIT and, and Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Anyway, they're they're associated with JCAP as well, and they've been looking specifically at this manganese vanadate, uh, trying to test out some new uh, new um, uh, computational methods that gave better accuracy, and found that not only did this stuff have uh, the right the, uh, the right electronic properties, band gap was about right, uh, the mobility was predicted to be pretty good, um, but it also had uh, the valence band maximum and conduction band minimum straddle the reduction oxidation potentials for water. Score. This is all you need. Uh, so what this means is that this thing would be intrinsically stable. Its band edge alignment is right. Um, uh, Sorry, the intrinsic stability I'll show in a minute, but the uh, the band edge alignment was just perfect for doing um, water splitting, and, and the band gap was about right. So the first thing they did was to go and resynthesize those materials that were discovered, and then validated that the theory was right. Uh, then they went in and calculated uh, a, what is called a Pourbaix diagram, and the Pourbaix diagram is named after a guy named Pourbaix who published an atlas of these, and what it does is give you the uh, thermodynamic stability of uh, it, of all materials, different phases of different materials, um, as a function of pH. So this is something that you look at immediately if you're putting a material into strong acid or strong base because then you'd be able to tell whether it's intrinsically stable or not. And they found that this manganese vanadate had an island of stability in this pH range and in this potential range. And so then um, they went in and tested it and in fact found that they had almost no photocorrosion current uh, meaning that there, that this material really is a stable. So this shows you that that through the use of compu of high throughput theory and high throughput uh, experimentation, you can quickly home on in on materials that have the exact right properties that you need. So we're could, right now this is very new work. Uh, we're working on scaling it up and making learning how to make really good films of the material. It's uh, there's no free lunch. The no free lunch of this stuff is that it's multi-phase in most of the synthetic methods that we've tried, and only one phase has got the right properties. So we're having to learn how to make it in the right phase and keep it stable. But um, nonetheless, this, it shows that, that you can um, work this way. And I should also add that this is actually a presidential initiative um, of, of uh, what they call the materials genome. <coughs> So this, this type of work fits into something that the President of the United States is extremely interested in and is uh, being looked at very carefully in all agencies of the government as a way of really rapidly advancing manufacturing, rapidly using the tools of physics and chemistry to rapidly advance uh, materials discovery for uh, particular applications, 
particularly for things like sustainability and energy efficiency. So, last slide. Um, so, where, where are we going? I mentioned that we're in the last six months of our final year of this project. And we've been focusing on water splitting. Um, this has a certain degree of device integration. You've seen that we can go as far up as, as making, actually we can make them this big, about this big, um, with, with all the right properties. Uh, and the big, the big issue there was making stable and efficient water, uh, water oxidation catalysts. That was probably uh, the biggest uh, uh, challenge in addition to the uh, stable semiconductors. Where we're going next, what we've proposed to do in renewal is actually put, do a full attack on carbon dioxide reduction. Now we know how to make high, stable high voltage semiconductors for, uh, for driving the reactors. We know a lot about how to um, be sure that things line up, how to design new catalysts. Uh, and, but the thing about carbon dioxide reduction is nobody knows how to make it s selective or efficient. And so that's going to be our main focus uh, in if, assuming that we get renewed. We haven't heard officially yet. Uh, and our target here is things that have a higher heating value than wood. You want to be, you know, wood is what plants make. So we want to be a lot better than plants. So we have to have a higher heating value. And we're targeting uh, methanol or better. Butanol would be great. Uh, butanol would be a great feedstock for almost anything we want to do. So I'd like to first thank all my colleagues. This was a photo that was taken at a recent all hands meeting. Um, and there's our director right there. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Basic Energy Sciences, who funds our work, and to thank you for your attention. Uh, Dr. Gould, I, uh, we'll have a question and answer session. I'd like to uh, make a comment or editorialize. I, I, I rarely do, and perhaps we're not supposed to, but I, I think. Um, <laughs> I was very heartened by your talk. I mean, there's a there's a sense that um, that we have these very difficult problems um, as a society, and there's two things that I'm I'm taking away. One is that uh, the, the, before you mentioned a presidential aspect to it, there was a sense of this is a, a federal program that puts together people, and obviously. You're, you're so capable and you're talking about it, but to see and get a glimpse into the lab at Caltech rapidly prototyping, or to hear about the MIT group rapidly sampling parameter space for materials, materials that could be solutions for our problems, uh, was just so heartening to, to see that happen. And, and second, that, that when you're talking about things that, that and, we have so many students and young people here. We know that we live in an economy that's based on, on the availability of a fuel that is not is limited. And whether we deal with it now or in, in the future, to, to see that people have been thinking about this. I mean, there's a, one of the reasons I'm a, I'm a scientist is my dad was a frustrated not scientist. He was a, an artist, but he was talking to me about hydrogen-fueled cars well, well, trust me, a long, long time ago, and and to see where it actually stands um, with hydrogen fuel cells it, it's, it's just amazing. And so um, we're, we're at 5 o'clock. Many of you are going to want to ask questions, but I, I just wanted to say those things because there are many talks that are, all of our talks are amazing. Many of our talks affect me, uh, but this one today affected me in a way to make me actually very positive about the future. And I, I'd ask everyone to sort of think about what was discussed here and how important that is. Let's thank Dr. Gould.